a heartly welcome on kiva sovit jin nursing faculty navant navamindra dhira jinivas tipko heartly welcome to you know first i'll tell the brief introduction regarding this webinar corona diseases corona virus disease and infectious disease caused by this called corona virus most people infected with this corona virus will experience mild and moderate respiratory illness and recover without requirement special treatment old people and those with underlying medical problems like cardiovascular diseases diabetes chronic respiratory diseases and cancer more like to develop the serious illness best way to prevent and slow down the transmission is well informed about covid 19 virus that disease cause and how it spreads protect yourself and others from infection by washing your hands or using alcohol based stuff frequently and not touch your face the corona 19 virus spreads primarily through droplet of saliva or discharge from nose when an infected person coughs sneezes so it's important that you also practice respiratory antiquage example by coughing into flexed elbow at this time there is no specific vaccine for this covid 19 however there is many ongoing clinical trials evaluated potential treatments who will continue to provide the update informations as we decide and clinical findings all be in the risk on the being of research as you know nurses is a key role of this hospital to deal the patient with covid 19 it's sad to know that so what of precautions we have taken while caring the covid patients still we get nasocomial infection the health work and especially for the nurses and uh, as you know this time approximately the 40 lakh people has been infected by this and uh, four lakh people has been died very sad to say and uh, it may be a lot of reasons due to the nasocomial infection to the nurses and uh, the medical professionals because of uh, lack of supply and the lack of knowledge regarding how to take care of ourselves and uh, sometime it's very uh, uh, sad to say that most people they have uh, very negligence while doing uh, care of covid patients so on so many things i don't want to share all those things in front of you because uh, as you know uh, as of experience of nurses we have a uh, lot of problems we are facing when in covid 19 covid 19 therefore for with the aim of complementary knowledge to the nurses the way called health and medical sciences we started this webinar regarding prevention and control of covid 19 try to explore the no- challenges of nurses while caring the covid patients and i heartily welcome all the participants i hope you will be in this seminar to go through and you will comes to know uh, the brief notes of control and prevention of covid 19 and also we'll going to explore some specific reasons and also our the two resource persons mr abhinandan bidri and uh, mrs dina disosa they'll going to share their knowledge regarding uh, evidence based practice on covid patients with this respiratory distress by using ventilatory supports and other knowledges first uh, i would like to invite our first resource person bontiva sovit madam dean nursing faculty navamindra datta university bangkok uh, and uh, i request madam uh, kindly share your experiences and uh, it will be very beneficial for us and our participants too i welcome heartily by vive college of health and medical science thank you so much and i will come you lot over to bontiva sweet madam when have you hear me can you can you can you yes can you yeah, thank you so much for being us okay uh, thank you so much good morning ladies and gentlemen first of all let me introduce myself I am an associate professor Dr. Bunchiwa Su, Dean of Kekalun Faculty of Nursing, Dawamindala Thila University. We divide our talk to three main parts. First, I will tell you about the background of Dawamindala Thila University 
and the COVID-19 situation in Thailand. Second, Ms. Luong Ne Puwatana Wani, head nurse at Machira Hospital, will talk about roles of nurses in handling the COVID-19 situation in Thailand. Last, it will be the section of conclusion and further development. The talk will last about 40 minutes. Please feel free to ask any question you might have at the end of the talk or send us an email. Now let's start with the background. Nawamin Naladila University consists of three faculties, two colleges, and two non-academic offices. As for the faculty of nursing, we produce high quality of nurse approximately around 230 graduates for Bangkok each year. Besides it, we also conduct research and provide academic services to the society. The faculty of medicine produce around 100 medical doctors each year and also provides medical service through own hospital named Washira Hospital. One of the high quality hospitals in Thailand with advanced care deep accreditation. During the COVID-19 crisis, the Faculty of Medicine Washira Hospital has played an important role in helping to treat the COVID-19 patients, as well as providing its innovative equipment to various hospitals in the country to deal with the critical situation. Next, I would like to move on to brief you on the COVID-19 situation in Thailand. The outbreak of COVID-19 started to show signs in the middle of January 2020, as the Ministry of Public Health confirmed that the first infected patient who was a 61 years old female tourist from Wuhan, China. Then a group of 138 Thai people coming home from Wuhan arrived that at Suwandapum Airport. The Thai government implemented quarantine measure to keep them for 14 days at the Royal Thai Navy reception building. After that, a number of COVID-19 patients have been increasing because most of Thai people staying abroad decided to come back to Thailand. In early of March, there was the first death of the COVID-19 patient. The COVID-19 patients were announced by the government as emergency patients. It's what the time when Thailand and many other places in the world lacked appropriate equipment such as surgical masks, N95 masks, PPEs, and etc. to protect doctors, nurses, and other medical persons while working to take care of infected people. The situation become worse when there was a super spreader at the boxing stadium, causing a wide outbreak to many provinces in Thailand. Many new infected patients were found in the middle of March, causing the number to rise to 322. On 26th of March, 2020, the government announced that an emergency decree on public administration in emergency situation by banning every flight and service venue to operate in order to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Nevertheless, at the end of March, COVID-19 patients were found in the total number 1,245 people with six deaths. On 3rd of April, 2020, the government enforced a curfew banning citizens nation, nationwide from leaving home during 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. On LP8, at the end of April 2020, the total number of infected patients started to decrease. 
as well as the number of patients who was hospitalized now, the number of infected patients, as well as number of dead is very low, less than 10 people. Let's take a look at this graph. This is the COVID-19 situation in Thailand. Bula is infected and violet is dead and red is recovered. The key success factors in dealing with the outbreak of COVID-19 are these as follows. First, Domestic communication is accessible to every Thai citizen through each community leader. Second, the public health was well, was well prepared for COVID-19, such as patient triage, quarantine, accessibility in healthcare service, hospital preparation in supporting patients, and establishing innovation using this domestic tools. Third, following the measures strictly represents Thai people's manner which includes having generosity and consideration to other for safety among all. And fourth, the government not only assists Thai people but we also help each other by giving charity to COVID-19 patients and other people who suffer from this situation in order to lessen and affliction and improving people's life to adapt themselves to what we call new normal. Our president led the Faculty of Medicine, Vashira Hospital, Institute of Metropolitan Development, Urban Community Development College to produce several innovations such as Vashira Facial. Fabric Field and Surgical Mask. Vashira Koval. Modify airborne infected is isolation special, VJR mode special, or Vashira negative pressure transporter. VJR mode box, VJR mode chamber, VJR mode room, VJR ARI mode clinic. Is a uh, acute respiratory infection and silicone mass N99 VJRNMU mass N99 NMU PAPR power air purifying respirator mini NMU PAPR Next, Ms. Dongnev, who is a Washira hospital nurse and expert, is carrying COVID-19 patients. We'll talk about the roles of nurses in prevention and control of COVID-19. Please welcome Ms. Dongnev. Could you please introduce yourself? Ms. Duong Ned, please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for being with us, Madam. Uh, it's uh, nice to see you. And uh, it's I uh, thanks you so much for your contribution and your experience on COVID-19. And uh, thanks you so much for being uh, with us. And uh, I request the participant, if you have any uh, questions on uh, regarding COVID-19, if you ask uh, any question directly to the Madam, I welcome you. I'll give you 10 minutes for in this session. And I welcome the participant if you have any uh, issues or if you have any doubts on this, I welcome you. You can chat on this, you can uh, put it in the question and answer, or you can uh, 
wave your hands i'm going to connect directly to the panelist and i would like to invite request uh, the next speaker yes. uh, yeah i'd like to request pradeep jangir sir i request uh, hello i request ritesh sir to unmute pradeep Madam, please. Madam, again, please. Yeah, madam. I just we are uh, looking for the questions. Mr. Mr. Pradeep, do you have Mr. Pradeep? Hear me? Mr. Pradeep, please kindly unmute yours. Mr. Pradeep Jangir, please unmute your. I request Mr. Pradeep to unmute the speak. All right, so I'll go. Ha, huh. you can ask a question, please. Mr. Pradeep, are you hearing me? Mr. Pradeep, are you hearing me? Then I'll cancel your uh, questions. I'll go for other one, and I request uh, Richard sir kindly uh, unmute Mahima Tripo. Mahima Trimoti. Please unmute your mo. Hello. Please unmute yours. I request Mahima. I request Mahima to unmute your. Madam. Please unmute your mobile, please, Mahima. As we'll go into disconnect, Mahima, and we'll go for another one. Hello, Mahima. Now we'll go to another one. And uh, yeah, I'll. Uh, there is one question from Ananya Singhal. The question is. sir i have a question is the silicon mask or more sailor than the other mask madam question for tiwa uh, sovit by ananya singhal is the silicon mask or more than the other mask question from ananya singhal to bon tiwa sovit madam request kindly reply for us Bonjour, madam. How are you? Now, well, kindly unmute your, please. I'll have. Hello, bonjour, madam. How are you? Mahima, Mahima, you can ask a question, please. Yes, sir. Mahim, are you hearing me? Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, you can ask a question to madam. Actually, sir, here it is too much network problem. I'm not getting anything. Too much network. Sorry, not a few minutes. ये तो 
Dina, madam, hi, are you hearing me? Yeah, I can hear you. Sir. Ah, okay. Thank you so much for being with us. First, I welcome Dina Disosa. She is a base in nursing. Uh, she done on 2005 in Bhopal College of Nursing, Downgare. After that, shifted to uh, Dubai as I assume RN. And I officially uh, I welcome Dina Disosa to this session. Thank you so much. And over to Dina, madam. So good morning, everyone. So sorry for the disturbance and all. As I'm doing first time this webinar, please cooperate. So good afternoon again. I'm Diana Disosa. I hope uh, you all doesn't need any much introduction about me as Mr. Ramnath has already told about. So when we hear the word COVID-19 itself, a type of fear comes in our mind. I hope you all agree with me. So, but as a frontliners, as a nurses, being a vital role in the healthcare system, we should fight this COVID-19 with some proper guidelines, proper policies and proper protocols. Let me not waste my time. Let us move on to the topic directly. We discussed in the first session, the prevention and control of COVID-19 virus. My topic is management of COVID positive patients with severe respiratory distress. So when we, uh, when we say severe respiratory distress, a picture comes in a mind, a person who is struggling to breathe, a person who is hunger for air, as we are hunger for food, the COVID-19 patients will be hunger for air. So they need air. The lungs, which is already infected. The voice is low. Let me. Yeah, madam, we are hearing voice. Okay. It's very clear. Go, carry on, please. So as we say, as I said, a normal people when they are uh, fasting, they will be hunger for food. But for the COVID-19 patients, they will be hunger for air. So that means the infected lungs with the COVID-19 virus needs more air. They, but the lungs will not be able to get that volume of air. So in this case, the nurses, what we have to do. So for example, the patient will be presented to the ED with the complaints, with the signs and symptoms like high grade fever or low grade fever with respiratory distress, like respiratory rate will be more than 60s. So what we have to do when the patient comes, first of all, being a nurse, we have to introduce ourselves to the patient, then check his vital signs, his or her vital signs. Vital signs, the word itself says it is very vital. So what it includes in the vital signs? It's a basic nursing, temperature, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, and we add oxygen saturation also. So when we see the respiratory rate is more than 40s or 30s, it definitely says he is in respiratory distress. And we also see the patient, some patients will be cyanosis. Cyanosed means bluish discoloration, we can see on the lips of the patients or the nail buds of the patients. When we assess this, I, I have to make point, please assess the patient clinically. Don't just depend upon the monitor because in some cases, monitor may give us the normal values, but cyanosis will not be shown in the monitor. You have to see the patient dancing the monitor. So please make sure to assess the patients clinically. So once you assess the patient, once you introduce, make him calm or make her calm, then connect him to the monitor, continuous monitor, and connect in the auto support. Going to the simple to the complex. Simple is the simple nasal cannula. The complex is mechanical ventilator. So the simple nasal cannula will, I have, let me give an example. 
what I have experienced during this uh, pandemic crisis. As I told, I'm an ICU nurse. Recently, a 65 years old man, American guy, who was traveling to USA via Dubai. He had just a connecting flight via Dubai. Then what had happened is um, he had a spike of fever in the airport. He went voluntarily to the airport health department. Then they checked his temperature. He was highly febrile. Then he was shifted to our facility. So when we received him, he was in severe distress. RR was 30s, saturation was 90s. So we just put him on nasal cannula initially, which is the first step of auto support. Then we continued. He was still deteriorating. Then he, we continued him on a face mask with 10 liters of O2. Still he was deteriorating. That is the second step, 10 liters of O2 face mask. Then we will go to the next face mask with reservoir. In this face mask with reservoir, there will be a bag which contains O2 already. O2 will be filled, oxygen will be filled in the reservoir. So it gives 100% of the O2 to the patient. In the room where what we breathe is 21 percentage and we are giving auto support maximum to the patients. But because of the infected lungs and distress, patients will not be able to have that full amount of air, what is really required. So the next step, what we go is high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation that is called NIV. So this high flow nasal cannula and NIV I'll just tell a simple definitions, simple explanations. High flow nasal cannula is same like nasal cannula, but it gives specified O2 concentration. It has the machine contains FiO2 in it and also the flow rate, the flow of like, for example, 40 liters of flow, 50, 50 percentage of FiO2 will be, we can set in the machine. That is the specific in high flow nasal cannula. If that fails, the next step will be non-invasive ventilator. In non-invasive ventilator, it's like just a mask which is put on the patient's face. It covers the nose and the face, nasal bridge and the face, mouth, sorry. So in this non-invasive non ventilator, it is not invasive, it is non-invasive ventilator, the air, the pressure of air gushes into the respiratory tract. It gives positive pressure. Positive pressure is ventilator is giving the positive airway pressure to the ventilator. So what happens in this is the workload of the respiration, the workload of the breathing is decreased from the patient and the ventilator is supporting. This is called non-invasive. But unfortunately, our patient who was in our hospital, he still deteriorated. So we were doing frequent uh, ABGs. ABGs is arterial blood gas. So in this ABGs, we see specifically PO2, partial pressure of oxygen. PO2, it should be more than 70 for a normal person, more than 70 or 75 to up to 100 in a normal person. What happens in the COVID-19 patients is even the pH will be normal, PO, PCO2 will be normal, but the patients will be hypoxic. Hypoxic means decrease oxygen content in the body. So if it is less than 60, that means we have to be alert. That period is called as, that time zone is called as intubation alert period. So in during this period, we have to start arranging the things, start preparing ourselves for the intubation. So when we plan any procedures, it is important to take the consent of the patient. The doctors will be explaining whatever we are going to do, like intubation, central line, everything. Then the first and foremost things are safety. Full gear PPE is very much required because the procedures which is related to the respiratory tract, like intubation, bronchoscopy, suctioning, is the most contagious form. During these procedures, the healthcare workers are exposed. They are the highest risk to acquire this COVID-19 patient. So full gear PPE means gown, N95, gloves, and also eye shield. Don't forget the eye shield. So this is very important. So prepare yourself 
your safety is first, then enter the room, take a concern, explain to the patient, then start the procedure. So selecting the ETT tube, ETT is endotracheal tube. So selecting the endotracheal tube depends upon the patient's weight, patient's height, patient's um, age. So for the male, usually 8 to 8.5 mm, and also for the female, 7.5 to 8. So once the ETT tube is in, in the place in the trachea about the carina, we will be connecting to the ventilator. In the ventilator, again, the modes are different and modes are many. It needs a separate topic. It is vast topic. So we cannot cover it now. So I'll tell you the main mode which we use in the COVID-19 patients. And one more thing I would like to add is the patients should be sedated and also some patients need muscle relaxant, that is Nimbex. Why we need sedations? Why we need Nimbex? Why not only Nimbex? Why not only muscle relaxant? See, when we give muscle relaxant, that, is on, that will relax only the muscles. The patients will be still awake. The patients can hear, patient can feel the pain, patient can see, but only thing he cannot move, he cannot do anything, but we have paralyzed him chemically. That means by giving some medications. So make sure before you paralyze the patient, please give sedations. Sedations is what we use here is uh, fentanyl and midazolam. So these two or else uh, profofol also we are using to sedate the patient. Then we'll muscle relaxant will give, then we'll intubate and we'll keep the patient with these sedations as infusions and also muscle relaxant as infusion. What happens if we don't sedate? Only we connect to the ventilator. First thing, patients will be very irritable, agitated, patient starts moving. The chance of tube dislodged will be more. That is the first and foremost thing. The second thing, the patient's breathing will not be coordinated with the ventilator, which is very, very important in the COVID-19 patients. When the patients are considered in res severe respiratory distress, it says like the patients are in ARDS, that is acute respiratory distress syndrome. Yeah. In this situation, the chest X-ray will have multiple bilateral infiltrations and also opacities. So they need to be paralyzed. The lungs needs to be rested and the mechanical ventilator will take over the work of the lung. So it is very important to sedate. It is very important to paralyze the patient and the machine and the patient should cooperate, coordinate with each other. The mode which we use on the mechanical ventilator is called as SIMV. That is synchronized intermittent, intermittent mandatory ventilation. So synchronized means what? The patient and the ventilator should synchronize each other. Second is intermittent. Intermittent means sometimes the patient starts spontaneous breathing, one or two. So this ventilator will support the patient's breathing. It will not stop the patient's breathing. So it will support and coordinate with the patient's breathing. That is intermittent. Mandatory ventilation is the mandatory ventilation, whatever we set in the machine, that whatever we set in the ventilator, it will be given compulsorily to the patient. For example, we set 400 ml of tidal volume to the patient, will be given to the patient. So we can monitor, we can monitor how much volume of the patient is receiving by seeing the ventilator um, there will be an expiratory tidal volume. By seeing that volume, we can say whether the patient is receiving proper volume or not. So we have to keep an eye on it. Again, in the SIMV mode, there are two types, pressure control and the volume control. Again, as I said, it is a vast topic. So we will discuss in some other sessions, hopefully. Then coming to the ABGs. In the ABG, what we have to concentrate is five aspects, that is pH, PCO2, and uh, pH, PCO2, PO2, and also bicarb and oxygen saturation. In some cases of COVID-19 patients, pH, PCO2, 
by count will be normal it is very uh, important to know we have to consider po2 when the po2 comes or po2 if the po2 is less than 60s it means the patient is definitely in hypoxic considering benefits and the disadvantages we have to go for mechanical ventilation there is no other choice so now our patient coming going back to my patient back so my patient is already sedated ventilated paralyzed so based on the abgs frequent abgs will do like every fourth hourly or every sixth hourly to know the po2 value once the po2 value is met then we will go to the weaning mode weaning mode is that where we will shift from simv mode to the spontaneous mode in this spontaneous mode the rate which is set in the simv mode will be removed that means the ventilator is not giving any rate the patient has to breathe so once this spontaneous mode is on we have to see for the apnea because some patients who are still uh, on sedations and all they will go to apnea one more thing sedations and muscle relaxants should be off some cases if the patients are really very agitated we can give mild sedations but make sure the muscle relaxants are off otherwise patients will not breathe so make sure the muscle relaxant is off sedation sedations are weaned off then switch to spontaneous mode so once if you switch to spontaneous mode we have to observe as i told we have to observe the respiration and also make sure that the ett is patent we have to do suction as needed don't just go and do suction every second hourly third hour it's not necessary the ventilator will show you the peak pressure peak pressure is when the secretions are pulled up in the ett tube it will tell us the peak pressure is high please do suction no it doesn't tell please do suction but it tells that the pressure is high it needs suction or if the tube is kinked or somewhere it is blocked we have to see where the problem is so we have to make sure that the ett that the uh, tube is patent so once everything is done once the patient tolerates spontaneous mode then we will plan for extubation once the patient is extubated for the uh, again for the extubation please make sure you are wearing full gear of ppes no no choice there is no excuses please 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 wear full gear pp so once the patient is extubated then uh, what the next it is the same as reverse process what he came when he came we put him on nasal cannula then we put him on a face mask so what we are doing after extubation is we will give nebulizations after nebulization face mask simple face mask with 10 liter if he tolerates simple face mask then we'll go to nasal cannula then we'll go to room air then i hope if he is good and my patient was successfully extubated and he is discharged home now and he is covid negative three samples so we discharged home now so these points to be kept when you are extubating mainly about his breathing his breathing should be okay and he should be on iv antibiotics from the beginning of the admissions and for the temperature symptomatic treatment paracetamol iv we are giving so what the take uh, one key points to remember is your safety is first full gear pp which is very very important the second is what is important is if you have if you want to give any medications or if you want to give any nebulization or if you want to change the filter in the tubings of the circuit of ventilator make sure you press the standby mode in the ventilator maybe you all thinking why to press the standby mode maybe patient will desaturate no pressing the standby mode for few seconds doesn't harm the patient one thing because why we have to do this the rationally behind this is see the circuit which is connected to the patient is already pulled with the secretions which means the secretions of covid-19 patients is with the covid-19 virus so when you disconnect without stopping the ventilator the pressure or the gush of air which the ventilator is giving will be giving so 
the splashes of the secretions will gush out in the room and the viruses will be in the air at least for minimum of three to four hours. But some states, some studies say it is like 10 hours, but recent update is for three to four hours after this intubation and all. So please make sure to turn off or to make a standby mode while disconnecting the tube or while changing the circuit or while putting the nebulizations or for any reason, make standby, give, do your things, connect it back, start the ventilation. So this is very important. And make sure you're wearing full gear of PPE. Again and again, I'm stressing this point because if we are sick, then other nurses should help us, of course. So, but we have to be strong. Then only we can help other patients to recover from this COVID-19. So I'll finish with this topic. Stay safe, everyone. Take care of yourself. Thanks to Bina for wonderful sharing of their experience on COVID-19. And uh, we have some questions on uh, the COVID-19 care yeah, patients. And I hope you're going to answer for these questions. I hope so. I'll first question minutes. from Ananya Singh. Uh, first question is from Ananya Singhal. She asking that, is the silicon mask are more safer than other masks like N95 mask, surgical mask, ETC? Could you brief it, please? Pardon again, silicon masks are more safer than? Is the silicon mask are more safer than the other masks like N95 mask and surgical mask? I think N95 and surgical mask will be fine than considering silicon mask because the study says even the simple surgical face mask will be enough. And in some, while doing some procedures only, we have to wear this N95. That is the recent studies. I hope uh, our uh, participant got that answer. And next question is from Sunil Kumar NR. He is asking that if I want to know regarding disinfectant protocol for ventilator used for COVID patients. He's asking that okay. regarding infection protocol for ventilator used for COVID patients. See, ventilators is a machine and the circuit which we use for the patients is single use. That means we will never use this circuit for any other patient. So it should be, it will be discarded. And the practice what we are doing here is the circuit or the things or the linens, whatever it is, which is used for the patients, uh, COVID positive patients will be put in two yellow plastic. That means it shows that when you see a yellow plastic, it shows it is infected. Usually for other patients like normal, like MDR and all, we will just use one alloplastic. But for the COVID patient, patients, we will use two alloplastics. So uh, we use two alloplastics. We will just discard the circuit and we have azo, uh, azo gel, which is used to clean the ventilators. And we will use clean the ventilator and we will fumigate the things which is used to the patient, we will keep all the things in the in one room and we will fumigate for around one hour and we will not enter the room for two hours at least so that all the equipments, the bed, linens, whatever used will be sterilized. And I'll take uh, online options from Tina Joy and I would like to re uh, request Ritesh to join Tina Joy for the uh, live session for the question and answer. I request uh, Ritesh, sir, please join Tina Joy for the online question. And there are people. Yeah. I request I request Tina Joy. Ritesh, sir, to connect Tina Joy. I request Ritesh, sir, to connect Tina Joy. Okay, Tina, Tina Joy, madam, please, please unmute your, uh, please, Tina Joy. Okay, okay. Excuse Thank you for me. unmuting. Uh, you can, yeah, you can ask questions to madam, please. Excuse me, Mr. Lankana. 
Could you please send the invitation link with password directly to Ms. Duongnet for permission to be able to participate in the seminars as a speaker? I need her to join in the meeting and share her experience with us. That's all. Thank you. Diana, did you get the question? Diana, did you get the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm reading. When muscle relaxants given to SIMB mode patients, may, can can you read it, please? Because, uh, okay. Tina Joy, Tina Joy, please unmute your speaker, please. Tina Joy, Tina Joy, um, I request I request Tina Joy to ask one one more time, please. Okay, thank you so much, no. Tina Joy. You can ask a question one more time, please. We are not audible. Uh, Tina Joy. Okay, then we will take another one. Is disconnected and take another one. Uh, can I suggest something, Mr. Rangnath? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. sure can then. you please can you please ask the question by yourself so that uh, I will not be distracted by no. seeing? You can read it if you because, can. Because they are in online, no. That's what they're asking. They are requested to take uh, take a question by online. That's what I asked them. No, and we I will uh, hear them request anything. all the participants. Okay, due to some technical problem, made me not hearing the questions directly. If you have any questions regarding the COVID-19, you can uh, write it in the chat box or you can write it in the question and answer. I request all the participants, please, you can write the questions on a question and answer blog. So it's helpful us, it so help us to get the question and redirect to Ms. Uh, Dina. Uh, Madam, Mr. Dina? Yes, sir. Are you hearing? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, uh, then one more question from Paulina Bracco. What will what will be the strength of hypochlorite solution used in cleaning the ward where the COVID patient is? I'll tell one more time. What will be the strength of hypochlorite solution used in cleaning the ward where COVID patient is? Um. Uh, I'm sorry they're to asking, say this. Uh, they're asking the, yeah. I'm sorry to say this. The concentration not, level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. The because, concentration yeah. level of this medications to fumigate or to clean the equipments is of the different departments. So we are not uh, dealing with these things. Yes, uh, we are mainly considering about the patient and the patient's uh, equipments. But the fumigation. Okay, okay. Thank and you so much. And okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. We will uh, take another question from. Mr. Parna Dungajai Thaidamurgat. The question is what antibiotic that we should use for COVID patients? What antibiotic that we should use for COVID 19 patients? I hope till now uh, there is no any specific antibiotic for these COVID patients. And uh, I would like to take another question for this. No, this uh, for this antibiotic specifically. Uh, the researchers are still going, but what they tell is anti-malaria drugs is very effective, including yeah, azithromycin. Yeah, chloroquine. Yeah, most, chloroquine yeah, most of them will use the chloroquine and chloroquine and also collectra. With that, uh, we will use azithromycin. Yeah. But still, studies are on some, process. Yeah, some research also going on to use of for the uh, AIDS uh, curing drugs on this uh, COVID-19, this research is still uh, going on progress, but uh, we couldn't get exact uh, antibiotic for this COVID-19. Yes, yes. Sure. And uh, uh, if you are free, can I take another question? Mrs. Dina, hmm? as we'll oh, yeah, go for yeah. next session. No, no problem. You can proceed with the okay, questions. Okay, okay because uh, thanks for your time. And I'll take for The question from Rohit Raidas, okay. how should I take precautions while my wife is coming from hospital duty? What measure should I take? Okay. Because he's asking about uh, his wife might be the nurses. That's what uh, he's asking that his wife comes from the duty. What measure he should take? It's very important. Very, very important yeah. question. Yeah, it's very, very important. Because, it's very uh, questions, I feel. you know why? Because my all, all of my colleagues have their family here in Dubai. So when they go from home, the protocol here, if we handle COVID-19 patients, the staff who is handling will take bath with a chlorexidin sponge 
before she leaves the ward. Once she takes bath from the hospital and if she goes to home, she will be in a separate room. She should not have contact with her husband or the kid or anyone at home. So, which is very important because we may be asymptomatic. Sometimes even our clothes or even our hands or something will be with the COVID-19 virus. So it is better to keep distance until this pandemic is get done. Okay. Thank you for your response. Thanks to Dina and your being with us and uh, you made uh, the good contribution for this webinar and made this successful. My pleasure, Thanks sir. so much My for pleasure. being here. And Thank I, you. Next, I'll go to Mr. Abhinandan Bidri. Sir, I'm requesting Abhinandan Bidri, please unmute your speaker, please. I'll go, in, I'll go in to welcome the College in Health and Medical Science, Bijinur, Uttar Pradesh, India. And I welcome Hartley Bin Bidri, nursing educator. He currently works in the SS Cardiothoracic Center, Basilodon, UK. And I heartily welcome for this session, sir. And uh, I hope, and uh, I, thanks in my personal view together for a long time. And uh, <laughs> I'm happy to see you. Uh, so uh, over to Abhinandan Bidri. Can you hear me, first of all, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We are hearing clearly, sir. Thank you so yeah, much for being good. here. All right. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me, Rangnath, sir. Um, as Rangnath, sir, said, we've been, we've been friends for a long time, and we worked together um, when we uh, post-graduated, and we worked together in Ankola for, for a couple of years, and then we carried over our friendship for a long time after that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, so uh, this, this is going to be a quick 15-20 uh, minute session about what's happening in, in this part of the world in the United Kingdom. Um, at presently, I'm working as a respiratory nurse specialist, so I'm com coming in contact with uh, uh, these COVID patients uh, on a regular basis. And uh, uh, my main job or role uh, is, is in the community setting. So I'll touch basis on what's happening in the hospital for a brief, uh, initially for the brief session, and then mainly concentrate on what's, how are we managing uh, the patients mainly in, the, in, in their homes or in the community setting. Just to start off with, uh, I, I want to give, give a, you know, a, a small picture of what is, what is uh, the epidemiology in, in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, this, the statistics which I'm going to give uh, uh, are two days old, so they're not completely accurate. Um, so uh, just, just to give a gist of idea, what's, how, what is the impact of um, uh, you know, COVID-19 in the UK? Uh, as of 19th uh, of this month, the total tests... Uh, which were carried out in the in in the UK was 20, uh, 272,552. and out of these tests, uh, around two lakh forty eight thousand eight hundred and eighteen are positive. So, which is around eleven percent of total, you know, total tests performed. So, you know, and in among these eleven percent, the deaths as of 19th in all the settings, in hospital settings, in nursing homes, uh, in the community settings, in all the settings is around 35,341, which is around 7% of this 11%. So uh, the reason why I'm telling you this is, uh, of course, it is becoming a very pandemic situation throughout the globe. Uh, however, uh, the deaths which we are seeing from these uh, is not that massive. Number-wise, 34,000, yes, of course, it's a very big number. But percentage-wise, if you see, out of 27, uh, two, uh, 27 lakh, 72,000 uh, patients who were tested positive, around 35,340 were, you know, were declared dead. Just to give you an idea of, uh, and these these figures are more or less similar uh, in Europe as well. Uh, I cannot I cannot completely predict how much how much is in in India or Asia or in, in that part of the world. But this part of the world, the figures are more or less the same. Um, I 
I joined a little bit late, so I missed the initial part of uh, um, Mrs. Dinah's talk. Uh, so I, I don't know whether she touched on the case definition of COVID-19. Uh, Rangnath, sir, I, I don't know whether uh, is it worth just touching on what what what, what is the case definition of uh, COVID COVID-19. No, I didn't explain about the COVID-19. Oh, that's fine. That's, I'll just quickly, quickly go through uh, what is the case definition, what we are uh, classifying uh, this uh, uh, COVID patients, or how, how are we uh, actually identifying these COVID patients uh, by the case definition. There are two case definitions, one in the hospital, and one for the community setting, which is which is given by a, a Department of Health uh, uh, in here. Um, so, in patient uh, for the hospital setting, a patient, any patient who's who's requiring hospitalization, uh, and who meet the following criteria: one, requiring hospitalization, as I said, and have either clinical or radiological evidence of pneumonia. As Di Mrs. Dina was saying, that these patients are so showing um, radiological changes or pneumonia kind of pictures, uh, opacities uh, and marked vasculatures and stuff like that. So if there is any evidence of uh, radiological evidence as, as this virus is causing viral pneumonia, so uh, that's that thing. Or ARDS, as Dinah very nicely went into ARDS, so I'm not going to go through, uh, you know, acute respiratory distress syndrome in detail, as Dinah has already touched on it. Or if any patients are having influenza-like illnesses, like fever more than 37.8 degrees centigrade, with at least one respiratory symptom, which is of acute origin, for example, persistent cough, hoarse voice, nasal discharge, nasal congestion, shortness of breath, sore throat, wheezing, or sneezing. Well, the recent update, which was given by uh, on this Monday, the Monday gone, uh, was patients are also showing some symptoms of uh, anosmia. It's nothing but changes in, in their taste and smell. So this is the very, very recent update just this week from UK government. So this, this is the case definition. P patients who are showing this kind of picture are fitting, we're fitting this, um, uh, the, those patients into COVID definition and we are treating them as COVID positives. Um, and in the community setting, it's more or less the same, but in the community setting, we are not able to perform uh, any radiological uh, investigations like x-rays or CT scans. So that part of um, hospital setting is, uh, case definition is not present in community setting. However, I'll just go through what's the case definition in the community setting. So patients who meet the following criteria uh, and well enough to stay in the community. So if you're not feeling well in the community and if, if they're not able to stay in their own homes, uh, they're classed as inpatient uh, if they are well and they're able to stay in the uh, in their own homes in the community they're classed as community uh, so anybody who's having new or continuous new continuous cough or high temperature as i said more than 37.8 degrees centigrade or loss or loss of uh, changes of sense to smell or taste which is called as anosmia which is a very recent update as i said so this is a very simple case definition of community. Anybody who is fitting into that criteria, uh, they are getting, uh, you know, either swabbed, uh, regardless whether they are in the hospital or uh, at home, they are getting swabbed. What uh, what they have done in the UK is they have set up uh, certain hubs uh, in certain areas where patients and uh, member of staff, like healthcare workers who work for NHS or private sector, can go and get tested. And the test takes around 30, uh, 24 to 48, 72 hours to come back. Until then, 
what is the line of management that's what i'm going to touch base on in the, in the community setting mainly uh, is self isolation uh, you know as diana was uh, was rightly mentioned uh, to one of the uh, participants ans uh, answering one of the participants that social distancing or social isolation is very important uh, me and my wife, we both are nurses. So what we do, and most of our colleague uh, doctors, nurses, uh, the, we are, we are doing is as soon as we finish our shift and come back home, we change our clothes. Uh, we have a little small like a hamper bag or or a bag where we put our all uniform into, and we go straight into into the shower, or bath, and have a good shower, uh, you know, uh, covering our face hair hands mainly uh, whichever part is mainly exposed you know we we, we, we are making sure that we, we are washing it thoroughly okay and drying it thoroughly as well so that that's what we are doing that's what is a common practice here as well there is no uh, there is no scientific background but that's what is a social uh, social norm here is is happening uh, Mainly, what is as as Diana also mentioned very 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 elaborately uh, about management of ventilators, uh, patients on ventilators and all that. So I'm not going to completely go into it. Uh, however, uh, the first there's a slight change in practice here. Uh, what now they are doing in very recent times in last 15 days or so, uh, they're putting mainly uh, the patients uh, onto an IV. Uh, most of the times when they go to the wards, not in the ED department though. If they go to the uh, cohort wards, what they have done is they they have identified certain wards where they can do NIVs, where there is facility to do NIV, and they've made these wards as cohort wards where uh, most of the COVID patients are uh, either isolated in a side room or they are in a bay uh, with with certain distance apart, uh, the beds certain distance apart. And they're doing uh, you know, uh, mostly high flow oxygen uh, initially with, through nasal cannula, cannula, as Diana rightly mentioned. And if that fails, then the next step is uh, NIV. And most of the patients, they are keeping long-term NIV as well. And community perspective, many patients are getting discharged home with some kind of NIV uh installed to them uh, installed to their uh, in in their homes where they can use uh, and we are also looking after niv patients at home uh, and people who are requiring oxygen that's one more very important uh, thing what's happening with uh, these covid patients uh, in long term is they're requiring long-term oxygenation even if it's a small one liter half a liter or one liter through nasal cannula or niv machines these patients are requiring long-term oxygen because they what what they're predicting or few patients have shown uh, that there is fibrotic changes long-term fibrotic changes in their lungs because of uh, lung injury or ARDS or whatever acute situation they were in the hospital so because of that they're requiring long-term oxygen and we are taking these patients on to long-term oxygen and we do something called as capillary blood gas through their ear lobe and then we monitor uh, their P PO2s and PCO2s and pH and all the other, other parameters. And based on that, we try and um, you know, manage the oxygen part of it as well. Uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, as, as Diana was rightly mentioning, uh, uh, you know, prevention is better than cure. Uh, so it's 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 worth doing all the measures which the which all our governments are asking us to do, uh, including the health workers as 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 a health worker as well as a responsible citizens of of the, those countries. Um, yeah, I mean most of the things which which. Uh, which were which were really important as an inpatient management. Diana is rightly rightly covered, and it was really impressive talk uh, by Diana. So uh, I'm not going to go into details of that. Uh, but if there is if there is any questions regarding community setting, or if there is anything specific you want me to talk, uh, if the participants want want something very specific to be asked, 
I'm more than happy to give another five minutes for, for the interactive session, if that's okay, Rangnath, sir. Thank you for the good sharings. And I acknowledge my sincere thanks to being with us, sir. And that's and, okay, uh, sir. I, I request some, uh, just I'll see the uh, question answers. Yeah. I request you to please go up to that. Just so before, say before, question. before we go into yeah. that, can I just Pardon. quickly interview? Yes, sir. Sure, sure. Uh, sure, sure. As Diana was mentioning um, earlier, uh, 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 there's a slight uh, difference in practice here. Uh, I think they're using antibiotic therapy in most of the settings in other parts of the world, uh, whereas the NICE guidelines, uh, which came in uh, April, uh, somewhere in the middle of April, uh, actually say that uh, if the patients uh, are not having any chronic respiratory conditions like COPD, bronchiectasis, uh, you know, uh, which can alter their life. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no need for use and use of antibiotic therapy. If at all there is a need for antibiotic therapy, the first choice of antibiotic therapy is doxycycline, a loading dose of 200 milligrams for one first day, and then 100 milligrams for next four days. Uh, and also there was uh, there's, there's some uh, guidelines saying that uh, no uh, improvement was seen uh, with dual antibiotic therapy uh, so there was there was near, yeah there was yeah there's slight change in the practice this is this is given by nice guidelines which is again a standard practice uh, in, in this part of the world but as i said i I've come out of ITU, care, ITU nursing for a couple of years, so I don't know the updates, what's happening in ITU as such here. Uh, but I, I assume that most of our patients who are going into ITU have some kind of uh, uh, chronic respiratory problems and they're receiving some kind of uh, either IV or you know, uh, non-IV non antibiotic therapy. Uh, so that, that's, that's, that's one thing I just wanted to touch base on. That's the slight difference in the practice uh, here, I think. Thank you, Thank you for your added, added information. Uh, first, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go through the questions. Yes. The, the question from Mansit Chauhan is asking, how will we find out COVID-19 patient in compared to normal cold and cough in women? That's a very, very interesting question. Yeah, yeah. And, and thanks for raising that question. It's, it's really, really, really very, very good question. And the answer for that is there is nothing. There, there is no difference. There yeah. is no absolutely difference uh, between a normal cold and cough and a COVID patient. Uh, you know, with normal, as I said, uh, normal cold and cough, what we class, classify here uh, in this season, in, in winter season, uh, is flu. Uh, so patients with COVID-19, they show flu-like symptoms like increased temperature, they have some nasal congestion, they have uh, sore throat. Co uh, initially, they were saying dry cough, but they're saying now is either dry or productive cough. Say, so there is no difference between a normal cough and cold or flu-like symptoms and COVID positive patients. So what now UK government uh, is saying, and most of the countries are saying as well, uh, is if you have symptoms, if you have cold, uh, which is new, which was not there, say, a week ago and you've developed a new cold. If you've developed persistent cough, your temperature is increased, you treat yourself as COVID positives until and unless you're swabbed and it comes, comes back negative. Again, uh, there's one more slight uh, uh, addition to this point as well. Uh, even if the swab comes back as negative, there, there is some small uh, portion of patients or uh, uh, people where there have been false positives or false negatives in the sense that patients swaps are coming back as positive, but they are not showing any symptoms. Uh, on the other hand, there are patients who are showing uh, severe symptoms, but their the swab is negative. So the test which they're doing is only 70% sensitive. It's not 100% sensitive or accurate. 
it's only 70 percent so what uh, the clinicians are doing uh, what we are doing is we are going on the clinical picture if the clinical picture is showing uh, radiological changes their symptoms are getting worse if their oxygen requirement are uh, getting getting higher if they're requiring more uh, intensive care kind of help we are treating them as covid positives Thank you so much for your answer, and it will be helpful for the the questions and uh, who are answered for this. And I thanks to all the participants for being here with us. And uh, if, you, if it is possible, can I take one more question? Of course, of course. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Sandeep Singh is asking questions regarding food. He is asking that any food suggestion for the COVID patients. That means dietary recommendation for the COVID patients is asked. Okay. Uh, just uh, thank you again for that question. Uh, again, uh, it's a very, very uh, good question uh, at this point of the time. Uh, I just saw this morning as I got up, uh, I saw a post uh, on, on Facebook. One of the um, nurses uh, who, was, who was almost a semi-professional bodybuilder uh, somewhere up north of UK, uh, he was tested positive, requiring intensive care therapy, and he's lost almost 14, 15 kilos uh, of weight uh, because of this, you know, uh, this virus. So again, nutrition is, uh, does play important role. However, uh, what they recommend uh, is simple food during uh, during the during active infection period, where body can easily digest simple food. Uh, in the sense, chocolates and ice creams are not simple foods. Uh, so body takes a lot of uh, energy to digest uh, these the, the, these foods. Simple food is like rice, uh, maybe chapatis and stuff like that for Indian perspective. It's slightly different here because uh, you know uh, people's diet and diets are different. So anything uh, which is classed as simple food, which are in high calorie uh, diet. Uh, again, is recommended uh, during the active COVID uh, uh, situation. Once they've recovered, they, there is uh, here what they're doing is uh, the community dietitians are getting involved in their care, and then they're making a tailor-made uh, like a dietary program for uh, patients who are recovering. Uh, which I'm not completely sure what kind of food they're advising. I assume because they have lost a lot of muscles and uh, and uh, you know their energy levels are down. So I assume it is a high calorie and high protein diet. Thank you so much for your answer. And uh, I'm going to wide out this uh, at this time to wide out because we've got time limit. And I thanks to all the, uh, the part panelists. Enthusiastically, they have uh, spoke on COVID-19, and uh, I hope it will help for our future and help for our participants who are gathered here. And uh, thanks to all the Vivekans and the Vivekal of Management, especially uh, thanks to Amit Goyal, sir, Chairman, Vivek Group, Vivek Group, and I uh, thanks to Deepak Mittal, sir, Secretary, Vivek Groups, and I uh, thanks to DK Agarwal, sir, uh, he is the financial advisor of Vivek Groups and thanks to all the technical team who enthusiastically support us without a press. Uh, thanks to all the participants also. Uh, especially thanks to Professor Bovinta, uh, Soviet Bangkok, uh, Thailand. She is accepted her invitation without saying any uh, no and uh, because of uh, her busy schedule because she's a dean and she's uh, managing all the university programs i uh, thanks to really i uh, thanks uh, heartily uh, thanks to all the panelists especially yes, Dina yes. and uh, abhinandan bidri and they also within one word they are accepted our invitation they are being within this webinar i uh, thanks to so much for you and i uh, thanks your contribution to nursing profession i hope uh, because of this personality nursing profession is going good and we will see in future the so many nursing professions and they'll come towards regarding the research and innovatives so the profession comes as of other lines and uh, i thanks to all the members and participants unknowingly if i left anyone i thanks to for them also and uh, especially regarding the e certificate 
uh, who are the directly uh, registered in our uh, webinar email and they'll get the e-certificate through the registered mail and if you couldn't get any such uh, e-certificate contact the mail we have sent to you and we will retrieve out it and uh, thanks to all the uh, panelists and participants once again thank you so much for being here and in future we will go through the next webinars and i welcome personally of you in future webinars too thank you so much for being here thank you so thank much. you so much thank you thank you thank you